Hi, good morning and good afternoon, everybody, wherever you are. Um, it's very nice that um, so many of you have come back for, for day two of this kickoff meeting for the current and emerging trends to crops innovation lab. Um, we just had a quick poll up there by Annalise. Um, so, so glad to see that overall, uh, over 80% are, are, are doing well or are good or fantastic. So that's great. Um, so, so hopefully that continues for the rest of your, your, your day or afternoon, wherever you are. So what, I, what we wanted to do today was to focus on the, the money part. Um, uh, the current and emerging threats to crops innovation lab is like many innovation labs. It is a, an agreement between USAID and a US land grant university ourselves, Penn State, and a large part of our responsibility is to disperse funds. Uh, so, so USAID provides money to us. Uh, currently, it's $15 million guaranteed over five years with the potential that that could go up to $39 million. So the idea would be that they would give us um, uh, roughly $3 million per year for five years. And in the process of these five years, we would find other money at USAID missions uh, in the Feed the Future countries. And that can be uh, through what's called a leader with associate awards or, or some other mechanism. So we could approach uh, those missions or, or those missions might be investing in things which are of interest in their countries. In addition, we expect that there will be other funds available from USAID DC, uh, for example, um, the emerging crisis around climate would lead to funds for, for example, dealing with threats that are that are driven by climate change or biotic threats that are compounded by climate change. Um, the administration is, of course, uh, really um, heavily focused on climate change and the global food security strategy that we talked about yesterday mentions this a lot. So there's, there's a lot of money, um, up to $39 million. And some of that money is just kept by Penn State to, to run the operation. That's, that's us as a management entity. So that's us employing um, staff members, myself, uh, focus on the, the administration. But then the majority of it, and, and at least by USAID standards, that, that has to be at least 50%, but the majority of the money should be used uh, for grants to drive forward this research for development. And remember yesterday we talked about how research for development is such a key component of all of this. So there's been lots of ways in which we've seen this happen over the years at, at these innovation labs, and, 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 and they're good. Um, the way in which we thought to do it was to sort of take a a leaf out of the book at the, 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 the Gates Foundation, um, where they, they have used these <clears throat> smaller pots of money. So um, let me just begin sharing my screen and I can show you uh, some of the components that we were thinking of. Okay, so we're just going to spend uh, time explaining the RFA process, and and then a lot of what we want to do today is discussions uh, because we have our idea about about what should happen. Um, but this is a a global community of players working collectively to solve the problems of current and emerging threats. So of course it's critical uh, at this early stage to to gain insights from the community about what they think should be funded and how it should be funded. Um, so we'll, we'll have discussions among, among you all. So I wanted to remind you all what the vision was. Um, it's research for development through a global platform. Uh, it's critically important that we keep this research for development in mind, where there, there's very important uh, operations of scale up efforts uh, to, to do outreach. But what we want to do is recognize that we're in a changing world. And uh, as the quote talked about yesterday, uh, rise with the occasion uh, so that we can do, we can adapt to this changing world rapidly and, and not have minimized the suffering overall. Um, 
we want to have a, a transformative change. Um, unfortunately, there will be a transformative change, whether we do anything or not, but it can be transformative change in the negative. So we saw yesterday how the state of food uh, over the last four years from, from the FAO reports is showing a, a, a downward trend, 811 million people now food insecure. And we saw that quote in the GFSS, the Global Food Security Strategy, talking about 92 million people who are now um, food insecure because of COVID, just directly because of that. So we're going in the wrong direction. Uh, we want to we want to make sure we go in the right direction, especially in the context of climate change. And a critical component, um, both for all of for USAID and now increasingly all of the, the innovation labs, is to make sure we empower the NARS, the, the national agencies of research inside the country. So that would be universities or ministries for agriculture or research bodies, as well as the private sector inside the country. So we're very, very keen on, on empowering those that we've heard yesterday about some examples of that. For example, uh, Dream Team Agro Consultancy in Kenya, doing that very large project on integrated pest management. That's a really clear example of, of that. Or Inera, we heard yesterday from Burkina Faso. So um, to remind us all of the, of the vision, uh, we want to be in a better place in 2026 than we are in 2022 or 2021. Um, we're focused on current threats and, and emerging threats. Uh, we have this, this acronym, Fitter Farms in Five Years. So let's break that down. We didn't break that down fully yesterday. So we want to enable forecasting. We want to know what's likely going to happen in the next couple of weeks, couple of months. Um, we can have forecasting for the next couple of weeks or months, or we can have forecasting for 2030 and 2050. And, and to, to my mind, and um, forecasting for 2030 and 2050 um, it gives us a false sense of security um, because no one's going to come back in 2030 or 2050 and say, hey, you got it wrong by 74%. Uh, it's not going to happen. So it gives us the idea that we're preparing. But of course, across Eastern Africa, uh, Somalia, Ethiopia, uh, Kenya, and, and, and Tanzania, we have people moving into the current cropping cycle. And, and those people are, are being impacted by the worst drought since 1981. So we must forecast what's gonna happen next week, um, and then next month, and then for the rest of the cycle. So we think that's pretty important. And forecasting also should be at the ground level. So it should be in field and in season. So those are two components. Um, inspecting. So we need to, we need to enable, we can't fight what we don't know. So we need to inspect. And then we need to build that capacity to training. Uh, the goal should be to have tens, if not hundreds of millions of farmers using integrated pest management practices across all of the various crops and stresses they encounter, as well as using the same approach to combat climate change. So it's really critical that we have uh, training. So the kind of work that, say, Diane Saunders was talking about yesterday with Dave Hudson of using uh, genetic testing and phylogenomics, they're doing an excellent job, but we need to scale up their capacity so they can train. And that's also, of course, a, a big component of what Marple has historically done and will continue to do through the innovation lab. And then to, to have, have that force multiplication, we want to have training of trainers. We want to build the capacities of youth and women for the use of um, the AI-based extension system. So, so we, we know we can build AI tools that are, are as good or, or better than humans. Um, and we also know that there's just not enough human ex humans in the system. There's not enough extension workers. Uh, we also know that collectively, we're, we're declining in our technical ability rather than increasing our technical ability. And so this all opens up the opportunities for AI to play an important role in helping us diagnose the problem and training people, as well as software in general, not, not just AI. And then we have to evaluate the success of all of these strategies. And then we have to uh, conduct research, particularly on, on the socioeconomic impact on gender and youth, as we heard about yesterday. For emerging threats, uh, we want to have a situation whereby um, we want to have a situation whereby we can forecast, um, so we can do detections of anomalies uh, through surveillance and remote sensing, uh, as well as machine learning. We want to assess 
these anomalies. So, so if something is emerging and it's a problem, we want to assess that rapidly. We want to conduct rapid research. And, and for, for this, let's really kind of think about what happened with fall armyworm uh, over the last three, four years now, particularly in the first two years. We just were not doing enough research uh, on this. Um, and so that means the, the, the pathogen was able to move rapidly. And then contrast that with the kind of research we did for COVID. Uh, so during the crisis, we did a lot of research on the efficacy of different approaches, um, and then we were able to scale those out. And of course, scaling requires markets. So a large part of Innovation Lab is to gauge with that, and then the surveillance. So, so did it work, the, the efforts that we proposed? So we're, we're planning a permanently open call. Um, we oftentimes, you, you might see an Innovation Lab putting out a call and, and then there's a large number of people putting in by a deadline and then the money is apportioned. But the fact is, uh, none of us know the, the threats which are, which are coming. Uh, we don't know what we don't know. And, and so we need to have this adaptive responses. And we were very happy that, that USAID have really joined us in this adaptive management framework. They understand the importance of this. And so by putting out, by having a continuously open call, we expect that people can reach out to us and say, hey, there's a problem here. Uh, it needs our attention. I have a, a way to do research on this. For example, there's an outbreak of African armyworm uh, in, in Kenya. We were hearing about from, from uh, FAO yesterday. And, and this could be a huge problem or, or it could be not so huge problem. So, so we want to enable approaches to this. We want to avoid, and this is one of the things that, that Rob Bertram, who is the senior scientist at USAID, has consistently emphasized, and, and after this call, I'm, I, I'm in, a, in a, a meeting at FAO where he's leading a steering committee on fall army worm uh, with him. But uh, he's often emphasized the problems of chasing ambulances. Just because it's, it's, it's bright and, and it's red and it makes lots of sound, doesn't mean we have to chase it. Um, so we simply cannot chase all the problems which we're going to see in the coming years. And, and because that would exhaust the supply of money and responses and it would drain the donor community, which we've seen uh, in, in the case of the locust crisis. And so by setting up these smaller pots of money, we hope to build a, a resilient interconnected network of researchers who can, with patience and, and attention, focus on the problem and, and develop research for capacity for dealing with those problems as opposed to these rapid. So one of the one of the research for development avenues might be what's the biggest threat? Uh, in the innovation lab, we often talk about the top five threats for the top five crops. So, so, so pick a country uh, uh, like Burkina Faso, what are the top five crops? Uh, what are the top five threats of each crop? And, and how do we deal with those? Um, are those threats related to calories of food for people in the country or are they related to export crops if you think about a country like ghana of course a really important crop is cocoa because it's important economically and it is threatened by the diseases we mentioned yesterday swollen shoot black pod but also compounded by climate change so these are these are the kind of things that we want to hear about from the from the community so um what we're now you know, going to do is, is try to gauge uh, your interest. Um, so we wanted to open up some rooms and have a general conversation. Um, but before we do that, I, I wanted first to, to see if there was any initial questions on, on what I had shared um, from, from the audience. So first question from, from Andy um, was, was what are the duration of the awarded project? So we're aiming for uh, 12 months uh, with the idea that we can extend. We, we, we showed you yesterday um, the partners that we brought together for, for year one um, and, and that they were called quick win partners, but it's not the case that we plan to continue with them for five years. We may, um, we, we're, we're building excellent relationships with them. And so we may, continue to fund them, um, we may work with them to find funding from them, uh, from, their, from their missions, but it's not guaranteed. So we were thinking for new partners coming on, it could be one year funding with the idea of continuation if it's, if it's a, an important area of research for development. Uh, 
but thank you for the question, Ali. Karim? Are you muted, Karim? Yeah, sorry, I was muted. I just have a question, uh, David. Who can take a lead on these proposals? Does it have to be host country collaborators or international partners or both? Yes. Um, sorry, I, I actually uh, should have mentioned that. So Serge had prepared these nice slides for us. Um, oops. So, so I think you can see my screen here. So um, projects funded under the RFA must have one principal investigator based at a qualified institution. So for example, uh, Dr. John Chalal, who's at Moy University or also associated with the Dream Team Agro-Consultancy Company. Um, uh, the PI from the eligible narrow institution must be actively involved in the, in the crop threats management and food security research. So for example, uh, you at, at Michigan State could join up with, um, so, so let's take Marisol uh, Quintanala. She's been working with Oscar Koch at the University of Nairobi, uh, or Christy Sprague has, um, and they could link up together. So Christy uh, could link up with Oscar and, and they could develop a project together. So it's coming from MSU and a research at the University of Nairobi. And, and these are the countries that we're focused on, the, uh, let me go back, all these countries here. So that's a, a good question. And, and so it's a linkage between yourself, a uh, land grant and somebody else. Okay, so we can submit the proposal through MSU, or does it have to come from Kenya side? Um, we're able to make awards directly to Naros, as we have done in the Quick Win projects. Um, we're also okay. able to make awards directly to MSU, as we've done. Okay, thank you. This is helpful. Bruce, wonderful to have you here. Good morning. Uh, glad to join. Thanks for uh, opening this up. David, to uh, allow us to sort of learn a little bit about what's going on. Uh, historically, uh, these pro the, the predecessors of these programs have focused both on the subject matter and on the capacity building through uh, academic training of different sorts. Um, the approach you're outlining uh, it charts a new course, if you will, and I'm curious uh, what the, the leadership team is thinking about in terms of uh, student training, um, you know, $100,000 pro projects um, may not go that far, for example, especially if you've got a, a limited time duration in terms of a conventional graduate program, for example. Yesterday, some of our colleagues talked about the great success they're having bringing folks with bachelor's training uh, into the system, but I'm trying to think as you, you know, you're, you're, I love this notion of focusing on the things that are uh, truly in the moment and emerging. And I'm also thinking about how do we sustain the cap, the, the capacity in our partner institutions and organizations to be able to address these questions in our next generation. You know, when we step down, who's going to follow in our shoes with the capacity? Uh, so, you know, that's the bulk of the question, David, I guess, is, is there a thought about how you're addressing educational uh, opportunities? I, I hear things in what you're describing even this morning that could be, if we're willing to think differently, some very, very creative approaches about education. It's a, just a different outcome. You know, maybe it's more short courses, more certificates. Maybe it's things when you're talking about enabling uh, uh, women and, and youth to be uh, conversant in AI, you know, maybe it's a, a hackathon kind of concept to, to, to actually engage the next generation in creating some of the tools that we need. Uh, so, you know, any, any thoughts on uh, sort of uh, uh, educational components, even as we, as we move with the technical solution uh, piece of this? Yeah, so so we certainly want to experiment and iterate. And if we find something's not working, we're really comfortable with stopping that and, and declaring we're moving in a different direction. We're we're certainly in this first six months uh, massively increasing the capacity of these young people who are focused on, on the field in Nepal and also in Kenya, and predominantly in Kenya. 
we have these young people who are developing um, these efforts. Uh, this FAO meeting I'm going to go into later on will show how uh, Brenda, who's on the call here, and, and Wincate and, and many others, nine, nine of them specifically, what they're doing is, I think they've released 560,000 parasitoids. They've met with frictions in the artificial uh, uh, su the supply of artificial diets. So they've done, done the in-country supply. And they've also um, scaled up uh, production in, in the labs. They've also worked with Bapana, who's a, who's a Penn State entomologist, and Serge, who, who's also at Penn State, um, historically as a as a as a scientist in virology, and they've worked with those individuals to increase their capacity in doing research on the ground all remotely. And I think that could be a new model instead of going to Michigan State for two years, because the cost of sending one person to Michigan State for two years might be equal to having these nine people trained in entomology with ICIPE and then with experimental design with us. But from this, how would we recognize that those people are good? Well, one way is we bring those people into our calls with USAID. So, so Mercy Tata on the call uh, comes to our weekly meetings and she, and she represents, she, she's a media coordinator. So she represents those young people, but she also gets used to being in a room full of predominantly North American based people, uh, predominantly, uh, oftentimes men, um, and not in the USA group, but, but in other meetings, and all, oftentimes older men. And, 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 you know, Bruce, you were a provost and a head of department, and that's how the landscape is, is dominated. So by bringing these young people, oftentimes younger women in, we, we develop the soft skills uh, in, in how to manage a meeting. One of the objectives we had is to is to is to build up their capacity and soft skills by helping them run meetings. Uh, James Mugo on the call runs meetings with the World Bank in Uganda, for example. Um, so, so that's good in terms of building the scientific literacy and the soft skills necessary. But how could somebody who's outside of our orbit look at Brenda or Mercy or James and say that person is capable and I want that person to run my you know ha has the the necessary qualifications. So with Kareem at, at Michigan State, we're, we're talking about a, um, a certificate program. So Michigan State are leaders in, in international uh, development. So we could have a certificate program and we've been watching very closely the new essentially Google University. So Google has revolutionized some aspects where they're doing professional training in Android development or, or product management. And we could have something like that for the land grants uh, where you could get a, a degree or, or a certificate from Penn State, Michigan State, Purdue or, or wherever. And then you could have that. One of the ideas that we're thinking about, uh, which I think is very urgent and important, which is a sort of climate change adaptation program or, or, or professional, so CAP. So the idea would be this CAP program would allow you to, to then say, I have training from the innovation lab on the biggest current threat, which is climate change. I have a certificate from Michigan State about this. So now I'm in my home country of Nepal or Kenya or wherever, and, and I'm gonna be in, enabled to go to the Ministry for Agriculture and talk about this, uh, talk about aspects of water moving in soil, talk about aspects of uh, uh, meteorological changes, uh, talk about crop water balance models and so on. So we certainly think that the model we're, we're developing is cheaper. Um, it is, is it more effective? That, that's important. And so somebody could come to us and say, hey, we'd like to study this. What, what has been the effect of the historical model of bringing people for two years? And what is the effect of the the, uh, the, the model you propose. Now, just because we're proposing something which is um, new and cheaper and perhaps uh, bigger in scale, doesn't mean we can't also have this, this you know, two year, three year model of somebody going to Ohio State or Iowa State or, or somewhere else in order to do this. That's also on the table and, and people can you know, advocate for that. Just because we've said grants of 100,000 doesn't mean it has to be like that. You know, we're, we're, we're open to be convinced. Very helpful, Dave. Thanks for that. And I, just uh, creating a sustained capacity is so critical. And you've outlined a number of ways. I would submit that if we, as 
educational institutions have failed to learn from the past couple of years of teaching in entirely new ways, then shame on us. And we need to think about different credentials, credentials that match the marketplace. Uh, you know, there's a human tendency to love to have the accomplishment of something like a certificate. And so it doesn't just help in the marketplace. It's actually something that raises the self-esteem of the participants as well. And so finding that, that blend of uh, new with the old, but really being willing to push the envelope with new, new ways of doing the training, I think is absolutely essential. So pretty heartening to hear what you've uh, got in mind there. So before we go on to Subi's question, does anybody from the from the Dream Team um, would like to jump in from 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 anywhere in Kenya or Nepal? Um, would like to add some comments to what I've said uh, about the your your capacity to be in the room and to get training now. James, I specifically mentioned you or Brenda or, or Mercy. Would you like to, I, I, either, any of you like to say something? Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. So. Um, okay. Um, okay. Sorry for that. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. It's, it's usually something really unbelievable when I look at our work and I see uh, an organization trusting my emails. <laughs> and uh, when I had the discussion, when Bruce brought it up, I was very keen to hear how you'd answer. And uh, I'm very happy that you, everybody's thinking about uh, you are growing old <laughs> and you need the replacements. And uh, you've given us that chance. And there's nothing uh, that we usually we are usually very proud of than this chance that we've been given. Uh, we usually see it with the old generation in our country and uh, they don't retire. We just wait and no one's going. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's a nice discussion that, uh, uh, and nice answer, David. Great, thank you, James. Thank you. I also think I have a point on this. It gives a lot of energy to a young person when you you like uh, James says people in maybe in our country wait for someone maybe leading this post should be someone sixty years or seventy but you got this experience and you you teach other people and maybe you t do it as a group it gives you energy and on itself it's some experience a big experience yeah thank thank you so much brenda and i think we all should remember so my background is in in, in rainforest ecology and and some of you in the us institutions might might know about dan jansen's successful project in, under a national science foundation effort so the problem we have in in biodiversity studies which i worked on is that most of the taxonomists are in Europe or, or, or America or Japan. Um, and uh, most of the interesting life on Earth is in the tropics. And, and he, Dan Janssen's model was something called parataxonomists. Take young people with minimal training from, say, high school, uh, particularly in Costa Rica under a National Science Foundation grant, and then fund them to collect the samples and sort them into major groups and then send them. So do most of the work uh, and that massively increased capacity and then massively increased our ability to do surveys. And it was a very successful model. And, and I think you know, Brenda is a great example of this because she is a, a very keen entomologist, Bruce, you'd really like her. Um, and, and she's doing excellent work on parasitoids and, and all the issues around building a lab understanding the, the 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 artificial diet having her colonies collapse building those colonies back up all the stuff that we have but the extreme advantage she has over over a, an american based student whether it's kenyan or american or some other nationality is she's there 5 days a week and and she walks out of her lab into a field and she can get more 
samples or, or more food for the diet or whatever is the case. Um, and that's just killer. It's just amazing if you have that, of course. I mean, I've done lots of field work around the world. And if you spend a lot of time in the location where you're sampling, then, then things go better. So thank you so much, um, uh, James and Brenda for that and, and Bruce for a very thoughtful question. Uh, Subi. Let me unmute myself. Uh, thank you, David, for that uh, overview. And uh, I really appreciate this idea of uh, having an open call for immediate funding on issues that are emerging. Um, uh, in that way, I, I just want to know whether the call is already open. Uh, because you said it's an open call. Uh, there are a lot of emerging threats that also is coming up. Uh, for instance, the spotted wing Drosophila, Drosophila Suzuki was reported last year in Kenya. Uh, um, we need to still have an understanding of how far it, it, it can spread and what kind of damage it can cause before it spreads out widely. Uh, it is more restricted to uh, certain foods, but then it can spread out widely. Uh, then other example is golden apple slain, snail on uh, rice, which was also reported uh, recently. This uh, apple snail is uh, actually turning out to be a bit more of a damage causing pest in the rice systems in, in, in Africa. So uh, issues like this keeps coming up. So uh, I really appreciate uh, this uh, approach of keeping a call open. And I relate it to the previous uh, TCP programs of FAO uh, that was there. And if that is an opportunity, I appreciate it. Um, my only concern is, uh, as we're looking at the emerging threats, there are also certain uh, path-breaking innovations that comes for long-standing problems. Uh, is there an opportunity for also to test such kind of uh, path-breaking innovations, if there are any, uh, for previously having long-standing innovations? Uh, and I support uh, 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 Professor uh, McFerrin's uh, views on how do we look at uh, capacity building with a short, shorter funding cycle uh, and a longer funding cycle. That will be very critical because this is uh, definitely related to sustainability of all those interventions that we are uh, uh, contributing to. Great, well, thank you so much for that. So I think we've had an example of, of the things that we want to achieve. We, we know some problems, but of course, it's only a small percentage of the, of the huge problems. And you based in Nairobi, in ICIPE, with your huge network or, or somebody like Dave Hudson with his new huge network and Simit are really tapped into the problem. So, so with Dave, for example, we were speaking about last week about maybe some problems in China regarding wheat. And we've talked about the issues uh, of Ukraine yesterday with wheat, uh, which is also being talked about extensively. And then we might have an issue in Nepal with, with wheat rust. And so Dave has this huge network of people as you do and so you and, and Dave and other people uh, are going to be excellent to tell us what the problems are. And so we want to open up a constant dialogue. So tomorrow we'll hear about how we'll have these subgroups. Um, and I hope that you can be part of those groups and really emulating the model we had from CJR in Promusa. So we can constantly hear everybody's complaining about this um, golden apple snail. Uh, this is really important. Here's pictures of it. We can have WhatsApp uh, exchanges and we can see it's very damaging. That's what's happening with African army worm at the moment. Um, and so if you're part of that conversation, then of course we're going to think about you as, as a person to have money for funding for this. Um, so we want to use uh, the fact that we do have an ability to give out money to, to canvas widely on all of the threats which are around um, and, and which are important and prominent. So that's um, one way in which we'll respond. So it is open immediately. You can send an email. We, we Maybe uh, we could put that in the chat, but it's on the website. Um, you can also put the uh, website in the chat, please. Um, but you can send an email now, and that will open up a conversation. Uh, and so, for example, it most likely will mean that Serge and I will jump on a call with you. And, and since Serge and I are both agronomists and disease biologists, we'll have a very enjoyable time talking to you about the problems. And, and then we'll help you uh, craft the application and, 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 and design it. And then we'll, we'll bring it forward to USA to get their stamp of approval that it's a good application. And then we'll, we'll start to roll out some money. That's the idea. Um, now we, we've sort of put all our money into, um, into, uh, year one, but, but, you know, as we're coming up to year two, we'll, we'll have funds available to, to get things out the door. In addition though, what, what also we should be doing is, is telling the donors 
what uh, is needs to be funded and how important things are. Now, I've been rather critical publicly of some of the conditions that have been created over the last many years in, in this space, um, which is essentially a Hunger Games situation where, where small pots of money are placed out and we all have to fight for them. Um, and that's not good. It's not good for, for, for international development and it's not good for research. And an example of this was, was the Gates Foundation uh, call that came out, Smart Farming, uh, which came out, some of you may have applied for it. Um, I'm looking at Jean, I'm guessing she has, you know, we applied as well. And um, that was 2,100 applications for five funded projects. Um, and that is a net negative for global food security because how much time did Jean and me and lots of other people put into that that could have been best applied elsewhere? And I, I, I get that gates were overwhelmed, et cetera, et cetera. And, and there's lots of other examples of this. Um, the Innovation Lab, for example, many good groups applied, um, but it's just not enough money. So I think it, it behooves us as domain experts, especially if we're spending a lot of time in the field where these problems are occurring, to in, help the donor community understand where the money should be spent. And also making sure we have synergism. So we have the plant health initiative that, that we're 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 uh, partnered with, uh, Prasanna is is uh, on our team, on our board, um, and so we want to make sure that if they're spending their money every year, which I think is about ten million dollars a year for the next five years, and we have up to forty million dollars or thirty nine, so how are we spending that money in an intelligent way that gets economies of scale, so we don't replicate things. So so uh, and and not just plant health initiative and. USA, but we also talked to Danita, which is the national organization, or we talked to somebody getting funding from them in, in Denmark with Dave Hudson uh, for Rust Tracker. And we want to make sure that Danita is funding work, which is complementary and not a repetition. So they were funding work in, 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 in uh, potatoes in late blight in Kenya. How do we make sure we're not just constantly reinventing the wheel and spending money? And, and how can the innovation lab help you by virtue of the fact that it's a platform. So that's an, another component, I would say. And the third component relates to your question of how do we build larger efforts? Well, well, that's really important. And yesterday we really signaled out um, uh, Diane Saunders at the John Innes Center, which is that extraordinary capability in, in developing mobile technology through Marple. Um, and so it's really important that groups like that who, who who can just do excellent work because of their long period of training are funded. Um, and, and we want to, you know, that's not a hundred thousand dollar grant. That should be a larger grant. Um, but we certainly need to build the capacity because one of the, the problems that we foresee is that we'll become complacent. Um, and, and while where something is a success, like the rust tracker, we'll think, Oh, it's a success. We don't have to worry about it. And that was a mistake we made in the United States with soybean rust. Uh, it was very successful. And then it, um, because of that, we stopped the surveillance and then it came back as a problem. Same thing for fall armyworm in the United States last year. It's a huge problem uh, because of uh, a very early spring and a very late fall because of climate change. So we have to be constantly aware and, and constantly do surveillance. So I hope that addressed your, your questions. Um, I think, Jean, you, you, had, you had one. So welcome. Um, did you see everything yesterday in, in the quick wins? Will I just run through those? Oh, sorry. I, uh, no I, worries. I had a conflict yesterday and missed that, but, um, let, yeah, let me... I just was thinking as you were talking, you know, for these hundred K second round grants linking in with what's already established, like you just said, in building economies of scale would be really important. So yeah. a recap on that. I don't know if everyone was on the call yesterday or not, but no problem. So we had uh, implementing partners. Uh, one of them was Dream Team Agri Consultancy doing a very large IPM package in Kenya. So parasitoids to control fall armyworm, uh, clean seeds for maize leaf necrosis, intercropping, which is also beneficial for fall armyworm, um, and then also in improving soil quality and soil fertility through intercropping. Climate smart agriculture using using uh, drought proofing with biochar, but also fused net data over 40 years, and then a bioherbicide from a private company uh, controlling Striga, so a weed. Uh, working with ICIPE, uh, building capacity in um, 
scaling up parasitoids and releasing them, but also conducting research on the economics of, of the of the intervention of parasitoids. Uh, working with IDE in Nepal, uh, so so co coordinating with CIMIT to do surveillance. Already a link between two groups there, IDE and CIMIT. Um, working with with uh, the gen the the gear effort at Penn State, which has worked with a number of um, innovation labs, making sure we bring gender in and also as a cross-cutting team. Uh, Anera in Burkina Faso, adaptive research and new IPM packages, uh, particularly around high value crops, um, but also intentionally building the capacity in, in Burkina Faso through Anera. Uh, MIT, um, using advanced machine learning, what's called agricultural scientific machine learning, where when we have a small amounts of data, we can still use that data to forecast problems before they become endemic issues. With Michigan State, uh, working on building capacity through training and content, we just mentioned the certificate a moment ago. Uh, University of Maryland Eastern Shore, uh, as a historically black college and university with an existing um, an excellent research program across 19 HBCUs. So making sure we're bringing in the HBCUs to be competitive for grants, but also as with many HBCUs, uh, the faculty are oftentimes um, uh, from many different countries, which is really excellent. So in the case of UMass, they eight faculty we work with and each one is from a different country originally. And it's really just wonderful because they have a lot of uh, strength. So we're gonna focus on uh, banana in DRC and maize and mango in Kenya. Uh, Zamorano in Honduras, uh, as we reach out to Central America and, and the Caribbean. So it's it's Honduras, Guatemala and Haiti. And they're working on something dear to you, uh, which is late blight, uh, because it's a lot of potatoes coming from the Netherlands. And we want to avoid incursions, but also as a staging ground for, for scaling up our dream team with the private and public sector, to focus on coffee and, and corn and, and, and beans in, 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 in Guatemala and, and Honduras. Um, we're a strong partner with the CG system. So we're working with SIP uh, to do point of care diagnostics. Again, something that you care about a lot, uh, building capacity for late blight, working with Euroblight and America blight on uh, you know, our ability to detect resistance and, and strains like a13 blue that you know all about um so that we're we're, we're understanding how problematic late bite is becoming and um, having better tools to track it um these are the kind of tools that 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 i mentioned with um john in center marple technologies but we're also really open to your work on on, on the pins and, and the point of care diagnostics and lamp assays and other affordable tools and, and one could ask a question is can we, you know, which is cheaper and which is more efficacious, uh, nanopore or or your pin system? And then, as a management entity, we we're sort of trying to bring this all together uh, by providing access to our platform and greasing the wheels, and uh, not just in terms of satellite observations of fields, but also uh, running large programs. For example, the eighty or ninety uh, dream team members in Kenya. You know, how do you keep all that going and not only that they can collect the data, but they can be trained as we've heard from James and, and Brenda about training. So I hope that addresses some of your questions. And uh, yeah, we'll, 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 we have that on our website as well. So you can see some details there. El Fatih. Thank you very much, David. I was just to follow on Sudi's uh, question on the, on the next poll. Yes, I understand there is a, a number of uh, new emerging threats that we can always look at. But I was just wondering, for the current uh, quick wins, well, for ECP, we're doing a very good job, I guess, and then we'll read the project on time. But just in case that while we're implementing this, that there's new ideas for the same problem that's coming out, could we also apply for some kind of uh, like second phase kind of a of thing to address the same issue, but in, in, the, in, in more like ideas coming through? While we're implementing this one, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And remember, it, it's not just applying to us; it's working with us, so we can both apply to the missions. Um, yeah. so, so we have the fifteen million dollars, but but we should be competing for the additional twenty-four million dollars. But in addition, there's more money that that we should compete for because the size of these problems requires a massive investment. 
So I think Annalise often says this about what was you say, don't be risk of, um, what is the word you use from Schmidt Futures about um, the, the risk scarcity? Yeah. The mindset. So, so, so we had money early on from, uh, would, would you like to explain it um, for, for, from Schmidt Futures? Sure. So um, I believe in late 2019, we had received a gift donation from the Schmidt Future Group as part of a way to move our organization out of the scarcity mindset. They recognized that we had uh, quite a bit of talent on our team, but were restricted in, in different in financial ways to implement and drive our success. And so with that unrestricted funds, uh, we were able to actually respond very rapidly to the desert locust crisis. And with that, then secure um, more funds in the future. But without that initial uh, bucket of unrestricted funds, we would not have been able to continue on our efforts on climate change ad adaptation and more importantly than um, rapidly assess and respond to the desert locust crisis. So. Thank you so much. And, and, and so this, this mentality is important um, because I, I think it's really critical that we move away from this Hunger Games situation, that we're just happy with small, the, the side, the, either we, either we, deal preemptively with these current and emerging threats or we react to the problems that come about. And we all know that building in resilience is so much more important than having to deal with, for example, the, the billions of dollars lost and spent on the fall army worm response um, because, because it had moved. So, so in which way, if we had it been effective in Togo in 2016, when it came in or into West Africa, in which way could we have responded? Um, and, and so I think this mentality is important uh, as a framework. And it's, it's also, if we take that attention, then, then I think it is important for us to advocate strongly to the donors about the necessary investment. I mentioned Rust, for example. That is a, a massive success story, but we have to ensure that everybody hears about it always and, and then we keep on funding it because if we don't, then things break out. And, and again, I think we're in an easier position because of COVID um, that everybody understands breakout infections, uh, they understand Omicron, they understand problems as they emerge and spread. So I think that's a, a lesson that, that we've learned. So absolutely, um, you can pitch ideas and talk to us and, and definitely see this not as a so, so obviously we've applied for lots of money um, and, and it's hard to be on the other side and you're asking for money you don't, you don't know, you're trying to read the tea leaves, but that's not what we want. Um, we want you to have open and frank public engagement so we can have more meetings like this about the money, uh, but also private engagements between myself and Serge where we talk about the biology and then, and then we talk about, well, how could we raise that money? How can we work with you to raise that money? Um, and, and obviously we, we're going to be able to drive much of that conversation um so so for example uh, i have the good fortune to be engaging with uh, senator casey's office uh, the senator in pennsylvania uh, he he is the one who's been driving forward um uh, the well putting for, forward the global food security act uh, and then it's coming up for renewal in 2013 or 2023 and Part of that is, is the budget item. You know, how much do we need? Uh, we have a lot of evidence from CJR that $1 spent is, is $10 back. Um, we know that investment in agriculture in, in, in developing world countries has a fourfold return better than anything else. So, so I think it's important for us to, to build our capacity. And we have a unique opportunity because we have the Innovation Lab and we have the Plant Health Initiative and we have national initiatives like the one in Denmark I mentioned. NORAD are, are investing about $5 million into Malawi. Um, so how do, we, how do we make that money go further by, by being a joined up international consortium and also using technology to our advantage so we don't have to reinvent the wheels and, and have shared learning from one place to another? So I hope that uh, sort of long-winded way uh, answers your question. Yeah, that's, that's useful. Thank you very much. Super.
So what we were hoping to do at this stage was to try to go into breakout rooms um, and we wanted to do it on nationality. Um, so yesterday, Annalise had some data on- Sorry, David, that's not going to work because we have too many people attending from different countries, okay. so, which is an excellent problem. So I, I decided to do it based on regional center. Um, okay, great, just, perfect. So, so that will, perfect. Code. And, and the idea is that when you go into these breakout rooms, um, we hope to be able to ask you a question in the poll, which which may or may not work in breakout room, rooms. We'll see. Uh, but but a question that we do want you to consider is 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 our idea of hundred thousand uh, you know, beginning grants is that a good idea? It, we've taken it from the Gates Foundation. We we've liked it. Um, but it may not be because the question that Bruce raised is that, you know, if you're trying to fund a student in North America, you know, that's all of a sudden uh, $60,000 a year. Um, so that might not be a good idea or, or the sort of stuff that Subi mentioned about larger programs. So maybe uh, you want to breed for resistance. So maybe that's something that CJR should fund because historically that's what they've been doing. So have those conversations. Obviously, if you're going to be uh, in Eastern Africa, and, and you're looking at $100,000, that's great um, because the cost of labor is cheap and, and you have access, you don't have to travel, you have access to all the fields and do your research in, in West Africa or East Africa. So just consider those questions. I think we're gonna stay out for about um, uh, 15, 20 minutes or something um, and, and just have a conversation. So please um, drive it forward. We also have a, a Google Doc um, that, that you can put notes into that Annalise made. So if you want to scribble down some notes while you're talking, and then we'll come back and, and continue our conversation. Thank you so much. Okay. Wow. Uh, that was, at least in the room I was in, it was, it was super interesting and exciting. Um, so um, maybe just we'll do a little bit of reporting out of it, uh, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go to where I was, which was Central America. Um, so, uh, oh, you had the current threats. Um, can I, will I share my screen, Annalise? And I'll just talk about the, thanks. Um, I'll just talk about what I what we were observing. Um, so we, we had some conversations about <clears throat> problems. Um, so remember in Central America, we're focused on potato at the moment and, and rust just to get going. But of course, maize, bean, and coffee are, are hugely important crops, the three most important in Honduras. And Denise was talking about things like tar spot and, and coffee rust. Um, um, Jean uh, Rusiano at, at NC State had talked about linkages between existing programs like the World Coffee Research uh, Foundation and USDA's effort in Hawaii, which were already linked with, showing the benefit of the, the platform. Um, and then it was very nice that we immediately had Jean and Denise talking about um, synergies and, and, and pre-existing um, knowledge of, of the country. Jan Kreutz uh, obviously has worked closely with Denise coming from the Potato Institute. So they had things to talk about. We then went into a large conversation about um, capacity building and research. So Bruce McFerrin with, with his deep um, experience talked about online courses how we can leverage the benefit of, of the last two years uh, in, in online learning and working remotely, particularly to have courses so we could train in countries. Um, those courses could be about domain problems of nematodes or, or, or bacterial infections or whatever, as well as epidemiology, which was a, what something Jean mentioned. So, so people could be trained in that. Uh, Bruce uh, McFerrin reminded us uh, that Ohio State had created 4H, which is a phenomenal program uh, that was designed to deliver education low cost. Um, and, and then another important point was having people fluent in technology. We mentioned this yesterday, how Pete McCloskey, our AI engineer, is training um, uh, AI researchers in Kenya who are now on the field in, um, in Uganda. So, so developing that capacity, uh, which, which is really, really good. Um, and we also talked about where would where would this um, stamp of approval come from? Um, so one idea would be that the a US seal is important. This was from Denise in Honduras and Zamorano, that if you had a stamp of approval from Michigan State or Penn State or Ohio State or even USAID, this is going to, to carry weight in, in Central America. 
Language is critically important. Uh, students in Zamorano could speak English, but we need to make sure, of course, the content would be in Spanish. Uh, that's really important. Uh, and we, we completely agree with that. Um, in terms of the amount of money, um, uh, $100,000 uh, for kickoff a, a project would be good in Zamorano because of the, the cost of labor. And, and, and then Denise was really interested in, does it have to be on the biology of the pest or could it be on the socio-political outcomes or, or issues around gender? And, and the answer is absolutely yes, um, we, we could have that. But then the, the counterpoint, and as we had kind of thought about in our general discussion is that 100,000 K uh, is, is not so much uh, from the perspective of, of a US university because of the high cost of graduate students. And especially if you wanna have graduate students involved, um, the idea would be that it could be larger amount of money. So that's a very valid point from Marisol at, at MSU. So who wants to take the Asia room? Pan, I guess. Um, here, yeah, so uh, we, we discuss about like how um, whether these um, hundred k funds uh, would be good um, good amount of money to start any any anything related to the um, this emerging threat um, uh, IPM innovation lab and uh, we discuss like for uh, local institution if we if we give that money to local institution maybe it will uh, they could uh, they could accomplish some some tasks like capacity building um, and also good for a small research project for. Uh, undergraduate student and uh, for a small workshop uh, and quick um, uh, quick queen project for uh, disease and insect pest emergencies uh, but it could not it it is like a pretty small amount of money if we'd like to include a big organization because they because of their high cost and a larger project and long-term project could also be like, um, it, it couldn't be sufficient for a large and long-term project. And David Hudson suggested that maybe we could uh, start with a small amount of grant, like give 100K for a first year. And depending on how, uh, how those institution perform on their first, uh, first year, maybe then um, we could give them more money to uh, work, um, work on that, uh, work on the similar same project uh, for long-term successful project. So it was a suggestion from David, um, David Hudson from CIMIT and and um, we have some suggestions from uh, Razan, uh, who is, who is uh, faculty in one of the agriculture campus in Nepal. And he was also like saying, yes, the involvement of um, academia sector with research sector, um, they could do something um, like they could do, they could accomplish a few things uh, with that, that amount of money. So this was a note for, uh, for the fund, like that small uh, fund. And we have, if you go up, we have also discussed some other like uh, threats. Are we also discussing that? Yeah. Could you please go up? Yeah, about the um, current threat, uh, there is a, um, so we have listed some of the um, current threat in Nepal and also in uh, Asia, which are like wheat blast, wheat rust, and citrus blight, citrus, um, Asian citrus seed, and Chinese uh, citrus fly. So this Chinese citrus fly is like, um, uh, it's originated from the China and now um, being, it is a big problem in citrus farming in Nepal because the citrus is one of the, uh, one of the major fruit crops and also commercial crop in Nepal. Uh, and uh, in Asia wide, if we, if we talk about the Asia, polar armyworm is also a major problem there. And uh, wheat bipolaris, maize stack rot, um, fusarium he head blight, they are also like major problem, major current uh, problem in Nepal. And we also talk about uh, emerging threat um, in, ne in Nepal and also in Asia. David Harrison uh, mentioned blast and rust. Um, these are um, uh, these are the predicted uh, threat in in the entire entire continent Asia and. Um, 
uh, and um, they could also expect like um, new races of um, LO rust and steam rust because of this climate change. And spot blotch in wheat is also like um, another threat in wheat crop in Nepal and also in Asia. Thank you so much, Papana. Um, and then um, do we have notes for uh, East Africa, maybe here yep. or? Thank you. Yes, we did it a little bit differently. Um, all our notes are underneath the three questions and we didn't talk about the 100,000 um, okay. money. We, I figured it would be a poll question. Um, so I can just briefly go through. For the current threats, we, um, Fall armyworm was the first one that was brought up, and then we spent some time discussing, you know, why is this still a challenge? Um, it was mentioned that that you, David, had said it started in 2016, and, and now it's 2022. Um, and so we talked about farmers' um, strong reliance on synthetic pesticides and the continuing prevalence of the host due to the two cropping seasons. And so we need there's a need to intensify <clears throat> the methodologies that are working. Um, and continue on that. Also that was added for Kenya and general East Africa region was um, the Drosophila Suzuki, which is fruit fly species, <clears throat> citrus greening disease, desert locust, tuta absoluta, stragoweed, uh, maize lethal necrosis, uh, general viruses and insect vectors, specifically viruses that have not been identified properly. And then we have abiotic threats included, which is drought and climate shocks. Um, we talked specifically in Uganda about the coffee berry borer, the twig borer, and the rust diseases. And then for Uganda and Congo, we discussed um, banana <clears throat> with the fusarium root wilt, rhizome root rot, and then um, also how to minimize impact of vectors by intercropping with some legumes. And then for the emerging threats, we kind of briefly just got into the variable rainfall patterns and how with some periods of heavy rain expected and longer periods of no rain, there's a higher risk of flooding and drought. And so a potential quick solution is to focus on short period crops. And that was- Super, very, very specific and detailed. That's excellent uh, comments from the, the room. Excellent, great. Uh, Serge, um, for West Africa? Yeah, for West and Central Africa, we uh, first for Burkina Faso, uh, we had uh, a participant working on, we also structured it in that way, the current thread they're working on, working on cereal viruses, different viruses they found on cereals, but few of them uh, cause a lot of damage on these cereals, on sorghum, maize, or, or millet. So those viruses are MCMV, MSV, MDMV. And they're collaborating also with uh, Central African Republic uh, University that's sending them samples that they're working on the lab. So Koala here that gave these viruses they're finding in these countries. And in, M in RCA, they found uh, MSV mostly in the, uh, that causing a lot of damage in the country. And uh, another uh, working group, uh, Gianda, that uh, their group is working uh, on fruits dieback, on mango, on cashew, and citrus that are caused by a uh, complex of fungi uh, that's Cerealia lazi, uh, Plodia, SPP, and uh, Polytricum. And those complex are causing the different issues they're finding on these trees. And also some uh, anthracnos on fruit trees as mango, cashew, and citrus. and some other fungus, fungal diseases on uh, citrus and some other of uh, uh, cash crops. And in vegetable crops, um, the main issue they have presently is uh, alternarios on, uh, on onion crops and also in tomatoes and uh, some uh, brassica crops as well. And um, the tuta absoluta is really present and uh, ilicoverpa has uh, uh, some uh, uh, pests in their funding on vegetable crops. And we have uh, in Ghana, a group working on alpha toxins and, and some IPM methods for uh, post harvest in uh, management for groundnuts. And uh, one issue also is the, the 
uh, the seed system is not well developed. So even the uh, some available resistant seeds are available uh, are, are done in the research institutes. The issue of scaling up uh, the seed production in many uh, in different area in remote area is not uh, developed. So that's causing some diseases to keep being spread. Even the solution is somewhere available in the research uh, stations. So that's uh, where we spend uh, most of the time discussing on the, uh, the current threats. And for emerging threats, that's basically the same thing they elaborate presently that kind of scaling up mostly on onion for Burkina Faso that taking a lot of uh, many spaces. You have the onion disease and the diebacks that coming in many uh, uh, cash crops. And uh, also the, the virus of, of complexes, they, uh, what uh, Kuala was saying, they don't have a good understanding of the complex in the they're finding the uh, the complex in the different crops. So that's something they need to elucidate because they really don't know exactly what's going on when they have some uh, highly pathogens or, or a lot of loss in the farms. So that's what we have. Okay. Um. Okay. Need to complete this. Uh, giving more precision on the different type of viruses in order to have the. Okay. Applications. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank. Thank you we so much. We didn't get to the hundred k questions. Yeah. No. No problem. No problem. Uh, it was good that we had a, a division of, of that. Let me try to figure out stuff. Certain. Um. <clears throat> well, I I thought it was excellent. I, I mean, it's just really wonderful to. I mean, that's the whole point. We want to bring lots of people into a room and then hear from those. Uh, not not just in, in us giving a polished talk, but but hearing these counterpoints um which is really phenomenal um based upon what we all heard now from the rooms we were not in or just in general is there any more comments that people would like to raise or or, or questions about how things are going i think it's quite clear that we're going to be adopting the adaptive management framework the other thing i would i would really stress that hasn't been there before but i, I mentioned a little bit about how um you know funders have the money so so we're in the position of funding and oftentimes that's a very, it's, it's, it's an asymmetrical relationship um, and, and the power imbalance is quite strong. I've certainly felt that a lot when I've been trying to glean some insights from Gates or whatever about money. But, but, but in, in the plant village culture, um, we have this, 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 this radical structure where everybody talks out and, and speaks and challenges all the time. And that's critically important. Um, so if you have a question that, that seems uh, difficult, please just ask it um, and, and raise it. And also understand that, that we want to make sure that people are really putting forward their ideas and being in the driving seat. So it's not just us deciding this because it's a collective effort. Okay, so any, any kind of responses there to all the stuff that we heard? Go ahead, Luis. Yes, I, let me put my camera up. Yeah, this is just to add a comment uh, regarding the 100K question. And because I was trying to think, because we're, as you and others uh, in the room, we manage both multi-million dollar grants and also the, the 100K dollar grants. Uh, obviously, the 100K dollar grants uh, will carry a long way if you are if you go with the small projects that are targeted to say a particular country with a very, very specific objective, but considering a lot of the indirects or the FNA that are going to be obviously put by both the sub award and maybe they have multiple partners also by the multiple partners, then I think that's a little bit constraining, especially obviously I'm guessing that there won't be deep research questions addressed, but rather just implementing uh, things that are already known yeah so that that's true you're, you're right with the universities have um uh, hobbled themselves over the last number of years in terms of in terms of um uh, the, the the well understood um uh, costs that that come from such a large administration um so it doesn't it doesn't allow us to be effective so one of the ideas would be uh, let's imagine um, you're interested, or let, let me pick, take Marisol at MSU. Um, there, she has to 
potential to work with Matthew that we heard about yesterday from on nematodes with the dream team and and one of the new projects coming out from uh, IITA is 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 protecting potatoes against nematodes so we could use different technologies it's fairly cheap to, to run two uh, well a large large um, experimental project on the efficacy of this new technology for potatoes and then do research on that and then also some economic data Marisol could be part of that and she could be funded um, to be for a couple of weeks of her time, uh, for example, to be involved perhaps remotely. So reducing that travel burden on her. So she as a nematode expert could be working directly uh, and getting the data. She could also drive forward a publication from this um, because she's good at publications and good at writing or, or it could be, um, you know, some small portion of time for, for one of her postdocs. But the actual research on the ground, the, the, the randomized control study, that could happen very affordably uh, because it is cheap to employ people in Kenya and, and, this, and these young people are very capable. So that's, that's one idea that we thought about. Um, and we certainly need new unusual approaches because the historical model is that the money just gets eaten up and, and then the cost of doing research is just too expensive. And, and if we can that model sounds great, David. I, I I love it. You know, just cover of um, you know a few weeks of time of a postdoc. I think you can get a lot of work done that way. I think most of the money is eaten by the cost of the universities. Just MSU, you know, it, the, the fees of having a graduate student are huge. I you think you you are very aware of it because you're in Penn State. So that 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 sounds like a great idea. Yeah. So that, that's experimenting with this for sure. Um, I think Annalise, you were going to do the polls. Was that something I saw? Yeah, thanks. Um, and, and so there, there might be a necessity to do larger. Oh, thank you so much. That's an excellent poll. <laughs> um, there might be a necessity to do something larger. Um, uh, for example, uh, let's say um, a lab, uh, John, in a center or Ohio State or something. Or, or NC State could do some development of the nanopore technology, and it's going to take two years to get this up and running for a disease that we've never done before, like like uh, coffee rust. Then that's going to take a two-year project, and it doesn't have to have deliverables, but it could be two years of a postdoc to focus on things. One thing that we do, and and our partners understand this, and our new partners will learn about it, is that we're absolutely brutal in, in, in being focused on objectives and key results, um, taking that that lesson from industry, uh, particularly Google, and, and, and this is the framework where we meet weekly and we set our objectives and key results and we follow those. And I, it, it's not the traditional approach at universities. Um, universities are, are, are good at, at many, many things, um, but, but, you know, being very objective about a goal and then measuring the success of the of that goal is not something often we do um, because um, the incentive structures are different. So we want to make sure that we're we're doing research for development in a very focused, orderly way. And we think in this way we'll actually get more value for our money because um, um, because it's important. Okay, this is neck and neck, huh? I would love to see a geographical breakdown of this, but we, we can't do this on, on Zoom, um, it seems, but uh, it's super interesting. Uh, Dave, off you go. Yeah, just, just a quick question. I mean, so you're adopting the Gates Grand Challenge model, but only part of it. So there, there was a two-pronged strategy from Gates that they would do the quick wins, the 100K, but then there would be the competing for, for the really big prize of like, a, I think it was a million or something like that. So things, ideas that, that were really great, then they would sort of fund it through to, yeah. to take it forward. And I guess, you know, like the Wobakia story with malaria was the big one that came out of a, a, a quick win grand challenge, yeah. but then it, it went to scale. Yeah. So any thoughts on that? Are you, are you yeah. going to have the scaling part as well or just the, the quick win? 
No, we're definitely going to have the scaling part. And, and, and so let me just be super transparent with, with how we've done for quick wins in the beginning, uh, if I remember things correctly. Uh, I think it was about 170 for Simit, $170,000. Um, I think we, we then gave about 400000 for the Dream Team, um, about um, UMass, about 140 or something like that, Michigan State, about 110. And, and these were the, roughly the projects to start. We didn't really know exactly what to do. Uh, Nero was about 100,000. Uh, IDE was about 90,000. Um, Zamorano was about 100,000. Um, and, and the idea is that that these could lead to bigger pots of money, um, just like in your case. So in your case, with, with Simit, we recognize now because of our weekly meetings, um, just how extraordinarily capable all the work you've done is and important it is and, and the work that, that Diana is doing for, for this. And that needs a lot more than 100,000. Uh, to my mind, it needs five or, or, or six million um, to, to build out the capacity across multiple issues. And so it's our job to go with you to, to donors, for example, the missions. Um, maybe we, so, so coffee rust is a problem for lots of missions and as well as America. So we should have a, a, a pot of money that could develop these tools like, like you've done for Marple, but for coffee rust. And maybe that's you know one to $2 million across two years, three years, to develop out these gene libraries and these tools and test them. And then everybody could immediately use it. And I don't believe if it's beneficial to five countries, uh, let's say uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, Honduras, Hon uh, Guatemala, and um, Kenya, if it's beneficial to five countries, that's only four hundred thousand dollars each, you know. Um, so, so, so we could see a situation where we have this pool, and and that's what funds that. So, so we want to advocate. I mean, I may be completely naive in my thinking here, and you know, USAID will 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 inform us uh, on this. Um, but that's one idea. But we definitely have to scale up these promising responses. I think that's really critical, Dave, um, for sure. The other thing that it, from a perspective, you know, we spend every week together talking at length, um, working on these projects, going through our, our objectives and key results framework. And um, that's just helpful for getting more funding because of, of that built up relationship, the exchange, you, you guys telling us what's important. And then this idea of um, the, 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 you know, the, the, the way in which we've already invested is, is likely to invest further. So I think that's, a, that's something that people should bear in mind. Uh, it, it, it's really good to keep an open relationship with us and engage us. Yeah. Um, so what is the ideal amount for an award? Um, so kind of a broad range there. That's interesting. And the other point about the 100,000 is just, the, it's just the kind of kickstart things to build capacity, to, to get things going. Um, but we also can do commissioned work. Um, so it's not everything will be given away in the RFA process. Uh, we can also decide um, as a management entity that it's really important, for example, that we focus on wheat rust and we can decide that it could be a, a million dollar grant. This is, so, and then, we, we, we build a proposal for this and then we put it forward and, and USA, it says, this is good. And then they would want to hear from our, our board. Um, um, so let's, let's say we go for coffee rust and, and then our board members, um, particularly people like Jean Rustiano, who, who uh, would carry a lot of weight because of her expertise in diagnostics. She would say, yeah, look, the world doesn't have this. And not only is it beneficial for the feed of future countries, it, it has a co-benefit because of the breakout of coffee rust in Hawaii, for example, uh, or the, the $28 billion that coffee brings to the US economy every year. Um, so then USAID would, would evaluate this and say, well, even though it wasn't an open competition, it is a valuable piece of work that we should be doing. So a lot of, a lot of what we're doing is trying to raise money. Um, I, I mentioned, I think, uh, this, this, this investment by the Gates Foundation, this, this uh, cloud system that we want to build. That's, at the moment, it's a concept note we're developing. Uh, we're doing a lot of engagement with CG, FAO, um, groups in, in, in Aarhus in Denmark, uh, Euroblight, to get that synergism. Um, and that's as, as up to about six and a half million. And that's to build a, a system um, in the cloud that everybody could use on day one. 
And we'll talk a little bit more about those systems tomorrow when we talk about climate change. Okay, um, so I think that this was an extremely productive and, and beneficial session. Um, anything from you, Serge, and in, in, in what you want to close out, or at least, or oh, yes, uh, nothing too special. Thank you, everyone, for your participation and your inputs. I think it's really important for us to have your feedbacks and what you think about uh, our different plans. And for sure, tomorrow's discussion is going to give us a good understanding about what's going on in your different uh, working area. And the idea of emerging and current pests can really be hard to assess. So we really believe that having you working directly on the ground to have our eyes everywhere will help us to prevent some big catastrophes. So I think, uh, being there and keeping things down when they start emerging is the best way to do things. And tomorrow uh, we have more time to discuss what is uh, pest or disease in your different uh, countries. But what we already got today from the different participants gave us a good idea about how we need to turn our eyes on, on how we need to prepare for the next five years. Thank you very much. The only thing I would add on is to echo what Serge has said, which is um, that it is so important for us to hear from everyone on this call and those who are not on this call as well to understand what the current landscape looks like on the ground and then what we can expect in the future as well. So we can move away from this pest of the week mindset and start um, introducing longer term sustainable solutions that are a low effort behavior change for farmers to adopt. And all of this information comes from those of you who are working on the ground. And so I really look forward to continuing these conversations and adding onto that Google Doc every month as we um, hear from you on what's um, happening on the ground. So thank you. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned the pest of the week. Uh, Melissa? Yes, I just wanted to add in, in the breakout session room that I was in, in the Asia room, this was mentioned, I mentioned it, but the other rooms probably may not have known about it, is that uh, starting for the second year when these smaller awards will be awarded, at Penn State, we've worked out a system where you can get uh, funds up front. So this is especially true for the small narrows um, and other organizations that may not have monies up front to make purchases and then get reimbursed, which is currently the situation that we have with our 10 sub awardees. But do know that moving forward, we have worked out a system um, where you can, um, if awarded money, the organization would be able to get some money up front to get started and make purchases and then draw down from that. And again, it would be based also on some uh, deliverables, but to begin with, you could get some money up front to make those purchases. Yeah, and and Melissa's done a, just an extraordinary job of, of navigating all of this, and it's been very, very difficult um, as we've started, um, but but having established it, we, we really want to kind of show that it can it can roll well. Uh, Marisol? Um, yeah, I wanted to say something. Um, Sometimes when you do integrated project, instead of you looking at one pest, but you look at multiple, maybe we can be more productive. For example, several trials that I did in Hawaii in a tropical environment with mulches, no-till, et cetera, um, turn, turned out to have um, significant decrease of several pests and diseases like alternaria in onions, and it reduced strips and it, you know, some of these treatments reduced you know, plant parasitic nematodes and um, leaf miners. What I'm saying is that um, we, we, we tended to talk about like pests and diseases as single things, but many times there's a treatment or a management strategy that can have impact in many. So I think collaborating among different specialty, uh, specialists and um, looking at multiple pests and diseases um, together um, can end up being more productive for the grower because the grower is not going to focus on one pest and disease. He's focused on yield and profit. So um, finding um, 
management practices that manage key pests and diseases and increase yield, I think that would be great and that will require like collaborative effort. Yeah, we, this is um, really uh, one of the reasons why our biggest award has gone to an, an integrated pest management package. This was something that Edward Jot had developed in the previous innovation lab, and he's at Penn State. And so we have five components of that package. And, and we believe that in, in, in deploying that, we'll have overall resilience. And, and maybe tomorrow we'll speak about some of these resilience measures that we've been collecting and, and spearheaded by Annalise. Um, and, and we have four point scale. And we wanna get people from scale number one to number four, but we, we completely agree. Uh, the overall package uh, leads to greater resilience and it has effects across a wide range of problems and pathogens, but it also has a great effect on the bottom line which is which is of course front and center for what we have to focus on we need to increase the economic performance of farms excellent well i'm going to go off for a two-hour meeting with fao um, um and <laughs> develop some of these things um but it, it's been really encouraging i thought i'd be tired after this one but it's super exciting uh, to talk to you all about this so thank you so much indeed um and i'll take that enthusiasm into the next room i go into and uh, thank you so much, and we'll see you tomorrow, I hope, for, for the final day where we'll get into the nitty-gritty of the, the issues which are facing us all and, and facing the farmers in Feed the Future country. So thank you all so much indeed for your enthusiasm and attention. Bye. Great meeting, David. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.